In a television interview, Philippine Chamber of Agriculture and Food President Danilo Fausto said, Marcos Jr. faces three major problems. Declining agriculture productivity, depleting treasury, and the private sector's low confidence in expanding their businesses. Fausto explained that a state of emergency would allow the new administration to direct LGUs to set aside a portion of their revenues to improve agriculture production and avert growing food insecurity. Here to talk to us uh, some more about the impacts of the looming food crisis, we have with us live via Zoom, Picafi President Danilo Fausto and Ebon Foundation Executive Director Sunny Africa. Mr. Fausto, Mr. Africa, welcome to The Big Story. Good evening, uh, Sean. Good evening, uh, Robbie. Well, let me throw the, the question again, just so you can frame it for everyone. Is it time to declare a state of emergency? Well, uh, the reason why we're uh, suggesting that the state of emergency be declared is that to give the president the flexibility to mobilize resources uh, so that we can uh, uh, jumpstart the uh, uh, investment in, uh, in agriculture for food production. We cannot uh, wait for the disaster to come or the shortage to come before we have, you know, uh, crops and livestock are being grown and fish are being grown. They have lives and it has to be done now because there are gestation period before uh, you can harvest the crops, the livestock and the fisheries. And uh, we are we are shown that uh, the treasury is now uh, empty and the one that is left now is uh, just perhaps for salary of government employees and uh, the uh, the treasury has no no money for development uh, so we need to uh, give the president all the leeway possible so that he can mobilize funds and uh, invest and help uh, productivity uh, so that's that's why uh, mm. we are uh, suggesting that uh, measure Mm. Mr. Africa, we, we, uh, we'd like to bring you in here. Of course, uh, with the state of emergency, that will have the president being able to direct even local governments. Uh, what are the pros and cons of a state of emergency in the context not just of agriculture, but of everything that a cash-trapped uh, government is facing? Mm -hmm. um, well, of course, the main pro of declaring any state of emergency is it gives the government extraordinary powers to deal with um, an extraordinary situation. Um, so I think done properly um, with full transparency and you know designed rationally, um, just giving the right powers, uh, I think could all could always be a good thing to do um, in, in situations like this. The biggest con I think is what people already know. Um, if part of the state of emergency gives powers. Um, in terms of too much flexibility, in terms of not following um, certain procedures and protocols, especially in finance. Baka ma family tayo ulit. And I think um, the biggest problem with the state of emergency, if, if the powers are, are made too broadly, they're prone to abuse. And in some cases, I think we all have already seen that happening in the past. Um, and th that will defeat the whole point of state of emergency. Last point. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very worried that if you keep on using a state of emergency to deal with an extraordinary situation on a very short-term basis, that might actually give the government an escape hatch to actually address the long-term structural problem. So I, I do agree with C, um, Sir Danny about the need to give that kind of support. Pero sana, it's not just a short-term thing. Let's deal with, with the problem now, not just with the immediate manifestation of the problem, but I think deal with the long-term um, solutions. And I think um, that's one possible con, um, fixating on the short term at the expense of the long term. All right. Uh, while we're talking about short term and long term, you know, um, in the latter days of uh, President Duterte's administration, uh, then Agriculture Secretary William Dar said that the food crisis, at least here in the Philippines, will be felt by the second half. We're, we're already there. When we're talking about leeway or a gestation period, like Sir Sonny said, how long do we have, really? Uh, you know, uh, for, for, uh, for crops, uh, especially rice and corn, corn will be harvested sometime August and September. And this is a rainy season. They need uh, dryers so that they can support the seven-month requirement before they harvest again sometime in uh, April. 
March and April. For uh, for rice, uh, we are now we are now have transplanted in Webasia, and we are already applying fertilizers. It might not be uh, we might have time to uh, give the subsidy now, but what we are so what we are suggesting is that. Uh, we, we have a triple cropping impacts for those areas that is feasible so that in order to have uh, more production of the land uh, and uh, the triple cropping is what we have recommended to the president, uh, just like what they're doing in Vietnam and in Thailand. And uh, as you see, 19.9 uh, million metric tons was harvested in 2021 and 75% of this are coming from irrigated areas. And so, therefore, we can estimate about 15 million metric tons are coming from irrigated areas. And one cropping will give you 7.5 million metric tons. With 19.9 uh, million plus 2.7 mil, uh, million, it will give about 27, around 27 million metric tons of rice if that will be uh, followed. And therefore, it will exceed the demand already because our requirement is something like 23 to 24 million only. And we're only assuming that uh, the harvest for the yield per hectare is about 4.5 uh, tons. Uh, there are high varieties uh, of these uh, rice uh, varieties that can harvest 8 to 10 tons. Uh, that's why we are proposing Masagana 200, meaning 200 tons uh, per hectare as the goal. Uh, we can reach 150 to 200, it's still better off, and we can meet the demand. Uh, for, for corn, we really need to have uh, floor price and how warehousing in order to make sure that uh, everything that's harvested can be uh, secured and uh, be able to be, be, be available. And uh, for others, like fisheries, fisheries we need fingerlings. Uh, and uh, our commercial fishing is already dying, and there, uh, therefore we need to go uh, perhaps uh, mariculture parks, and we can take care of fishes uh, in cages in the ocean and the sea, and uh, increase our activity in aquaculture. Because those that cannot, uh, that are buying uh, hogs or, or pork are uh, maybe shifting to fish, uh, also chicken. Chicken have problems on uh, uh, hatching eggs uh, because before last year, based on the report of our member, Ubra, uh, they have reported the chicken uh, hatching eggs to be reported about 15 million hatching eggs. And now they have only have imported about seven, a little over 700,000. And we will, we, without uh, the old chicks, we will not have chicken. So immediately, uh, we, there is there's a need for intervention uh, of government. And since there is no resources right now, uh, because the, the the budget for 2022 has been front loaded by the Duterte administration, um, then the uh, Marcos uh, administration do not have the resources to mobilize uh, for food production. And, and given given that uh, Mr. Mr. Africa and Mr. Fausto, what does the op where does that put government in terms of whatever options it still has uh, in terms of importing? Ah, well, um, I sort of want to sort of jump in first. I think one important measure that should be in any emergency powers is actually setting price controls. Um, I think there has been a long time problem with a lot of profiteering, hoarding, you know, there is also price manipulation happening. Um, we don't know yet if it's happening now, but I think it's something that um, the government can, can, can give more attention to. Um, because I think like, like Silky Sir Danny said, Using the financing method to try to resolve a food crisis, it, it, it takes time, you know. I mean, kung baga, na nagutom na yung mga tao, then you wait like three, four, five months actually for a new harvest to actually um, to actually improve. So I want to highlight, I think price controls should be considered as part of any emergency powers because if you don't have that, um, the most we're going to get from just a mere financing approach to the emergency powers, we're getting a head start of maybe six months in the remainder of 2022. I the new budget comes in um, 2023 anyway. So I think we have to think beyond just the, um, the financing aspect. Um, in terms of importation, again, that's always been a big problem for us because um, the rice tarification law, for instance, it affected so many rice farmers. Um, on average, rice farmers lost about 12,000 pesos per hectare after rice tarification. Um, we have heard the reports, we don't know how many, that many rice farmers have stopped rice farming because it wasn't um, productive enough for them anymore. So that approach of using importing 
to 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 fill in a temp uh, a short term gap that actually might have long term consequences. So I, that's why I think we, we really should be tying in any short term measures like price control, like increasing financing, like more support for agriculture right now. We really think it should be tied into a long term strategy for protecting domestic agriculture, for supporting domestic agriculture. And one thing we do want to stress: domestic agriculture has fallen to its smallest share of the economy in the country's history even before the pandemic in 2019 it was just above 9% and that's because of long term government neglect so i'm i'm going to sort of go back full circle emergency powers you know we always make a show of responding to an immediate crisis and then you know there is this big spectacle of taking action but then when the crisis from face for media attention the big the basic problems are still there so we do want to think that it's best to fold it into a long term structural approach to fixing the long term problems of Philippine agriculture.